Chapter 59 The Deliverance of the Demon Bhauma Sura Chapter 59, yes. The story of Bhauma Sura, how he kidnapped and made captive 16,000 princesses by collecting them from the palaces of various kings and how he was killed by Krishna, the Supreme Lord of wonderful character, is all described by Shukadev Goswami to King Parikshit in Srimad Bhagavatam. Generally, the demons are always against the demigods. This demon, Bhaumasura, having become very powerful, took by force the umbrella from the throne of the demigod Varuna. He also took the earrings of Aditi, the mother of the demigods. He conquered the portion of heavenly Mount Meru known as Mani Parvata and occupied it. The king of the heavenly planets, Indra, therefore came to Dwaraka to complain about Bhaumasura before Lord Krishna. Hearing this complaint by Indra, the king of heaven, Lord Krishna, accompanied by his wife Satyabhama, immediately started for the abode of Bhaumasura. The two of them rode on the back of Garuda, who flew them to Pragyotisa Pura, Bhaumasura's capital city. To enter the city of Pragyotisha Pura was not a very easy task because it was well fortified. First of all, there were four strongholds guarding the four directions of the city, which was well protected on all sides by formidable military strength. The next boundary was a water canal all around the city and in addition to the and in addition the whole city was surrounded by electric wires the next fortification was of anila a gaseous 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 substance after this there was a network of barbed wire constructed by a demon of the name Mura. The city appeared well protected, even in terms of today's scientific advancements. When Krishna arrived, he broke all the strongholds to pieces by the stroke of his club and scattered the military strength here and there by the constant onslaught of his arrows. With his celebrated Sudarshana Chakra, he counteracted the electrified boundary, annihilated the canals of water and the gases boundaries, and cut to pieces the electrified network fabricated by the demon Mura. By the vibration of his conch shell, he broke the hearts of the great fighters and also broke the fighting machines that were there. Similarly, he broke the walls around the city with his invincible club. The vibration of Lord Krishna's conch shell sounded like a thunderbolt at the time of the dissolution of the whole cosmic manifestation. 
the demon Mura heard the vibration of the conch shell, awakened from his sleep and came out to see what had happened. He had five heads and had long been living within the water. The Mura demon was as brilliant as the sun at the time of dissolution of the cosmos and his temper was like blazing fire. The effulgence of his body was so dazzling that he was difficult to see with open eyes. When he came out, he first took out his trident and rushed the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The demon Mura in his onslaught was like a big snake attacking Garuda. His angry mood was very severe and he appeared ready to devour the three worlds. First of all, he attacked the carrier of Krishna, Garuda, by whirling and then throwing his trident. And through his five mouths, he vibrated sounds like the roaring of a lion. These roaring vibrations spread all over the atmosphere until they extended all over the world and into outer space, up and down and out to the ten directions, rumbling throughout the entire universe. Lord Krishna saw that the trident of the Mura demon was rushing towards his carrier, Garuda. Immediately, by a trick of his hand, he took two arrows and threw them towards the trident, cutting it to pieces. Simultaneously, using many arrows, he pierced the mouths of the demon Mura. When the Mura demon saw himself outmaneuvered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he immediately began to strike the Lord in great anger with his club. But Lord Krishna, with his own club, broke the club of Mura to pieces before it could reach him. The demon, bereft of his weapon, decided to attack Krishna with his strong arms. But Krishna, with the aid of his Sudarshana Chakra, immediately separated the demon's five heads from his body. The demon then fell into the water, just as the peak of a mountain falls into the ocean after being struck by the thunderbolt of Indra. This demon Mura had seven sons named Tamra, Antariksha, Shravana, Vibhavasa, Vibhavasu, Vasu, Nabasvan, and Aruna. All of them became puffed up and vengeful because of the death of their father, and to retaliate they prepared in great anger to fight with Krishna. They equipped themselves with the necessary weapons and situated Pitha, another demon, to act as commander in the battle. By the order of Bhaumasura, all of them combinedly attacked Krishna. When they came before Lord Krishna, they began to shower him with many kinds of weapons, like swords, clubs, lances, arrows, and tridents. But they did not know that the strength of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is unlimited and invincible. Krishna, with his arrows, cut all the weapons of the men of Bhaumasura into pieces, like grains. Krishna then threw his weapons and Bhaumasura's commander-in-chief, Pita, along with his assistants, fell down, their military dress cut off and their legs their heads, legs, arms, and thighs severed. All of them were sent to the superintendent of death, Yamaraj. Bhaumasura, who is also known as Narakasura, 
happened to be the son of the earth personified. When he saw that all his soldiers, commanders and fighters had been killed on the battlefield by the strokes of the weapons of the personality of Godhead, he became exceedingly angry at the Lord. He then came out of the city with a great number of elephants who had all been born and brought up on the seashore. All of them were highly intoxicated. When they came out, they saw that Lord Krishna and his wife were beautifully situated high in outer space, just like a blackish cloud about the sun, glittering with the light of electricity. The demon Bhaumasura immediately released a weapon called Shatagni, by which he could kill hundreds of warriors with one stroke. And all his assistants simultaneously threw their respective weapons at the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Krishna counteracted all these weapons by releasing his feathered arrows. The result of this fight was that all the soldiers and commanders of Bhaumasura fell to the ground, their arms, legs and heads separated from their trunks, and all their horses and elephants also fell with them. In this way, all the weapons released by Bhaumasura were cut to pieces by the Lord's arrows. The Lord was fighting on the back of Garuda, who was helping him by striking the horses and elephants with his wings and scratching their heads with his nails and sharp beak. The elephants, feeling much pain from Garuda's attack on them, also dispersed from the battlefield. Bhaumasura alone remained on the battlefield and he engaged himself in fighting with Krishna. He saw that Krishna's carrier, Garuda, had caused great disturbance to his soldiers and elephants, and in great anger he struck Garuda with all his strength, which defied the strength of a thunderbolt. Fortunately, Garuda was not an ordinary bird, and he felt the strokes given by Bhaumasura just as a great elephant feels the impact of a garland of flowers. Bhaumasura thus came to see that none of his tricks would act upon Krishna, and he became aware that all his attempts to kill Krishna would be frustrated. Yet he tried for the last time taking a trident in his hand to strike him. Krishna was so dexterous that before Bhaumasura could throw his trident, his head was cut off by the sharp Sudarshana Chakra. His head, illuminated by earrings and a helmet, fell down on the battlefield. On the occasion of Bhaumasura's being killed by Lord Krishna, all the demons Relatives screamed in disappointment and the saintly persons glorified the chivalrous activities of the Lord. Taking this opportunity, the denizens of the heavenly planets showered flowers on the Lord. At this time, the earth personified appeared before Lord Krishna and greeted him with a Vaijayanti gar flower garland. She then returned the dazzling earrings of Aditi, bedecked with jewels and gold. She also returned the umbrella of Varuna, along with a valuable jewel, which she presented to Krishna. After this, the earth personified offered her prayers to Krishna, the Supreme Personality and Master of the World, who is always worshipped by exalted demigods. She fell down in obeisances and, in great devotional ecstasy, began to speak. Well, it looks like we have enough time that we can continue and finish the chapter, wouldn't you say? We're about halfway through. 
about halfway through and we didn't take so much time. So let's take a deep breath or two because we've been reading for a while and we have more. Uh, now the prayers come, which will have substantial philosophy as usual. So we'll just take a moment or so. Let our reader catch his breath. Let me catch my breath. And when you're ready, you can continue. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord, who is always present with four symbols, namely his conch shell, disc, lotus, and club, and who is the Lord of all demigods. Please accept my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are the super soul, and in order to satisfy the aspirations of your devotees, you descend to the earth in your various transcendental incarnations, which are just appropriate to the devotee's worshipful desire. Kindly accept my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, the lotus flower grows out of your navel and you are always decorated with a garland of lotus flowers. Your eyes are always spread like the petals of the lotus flower and therefore they are all pleasing to the eyes of others. Your soft and delicate lotus feet are always worshipped by your unalloyed devotees and those lotus feet pacify their lotus-like hearts. I therefore repeatedly offer my respectful obeisances unto you. You possess all beauty, strength, fame, property, knowledge and renunciation. You are the shelter of all six opulences. Although you are all pervading, you have appeared as the son of Vasudev. Please, therefore, accept my respectful obeisances. You are the original Supreme Personality of Godhead and the Supreme Cause of all causes. Only your Lordship is the reservoir of all knowledge. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Personally, you are unborn. Still, you are the father of the whole cosmic manifestation. You are the reservoir and shelter of all kinds of energies. The manifested appearance of this world is caused by you, and you are both the cause and effect of this cosmic manifestation. Please, therefore, accept my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, as for the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, they are not independent of you. Give two. Um, when there is a necessity of creating this cosmic manifestation, you create your passionate appearance of Brahma. And when you want to maintain this cosmic manifestation, you expand yourself as Lord Vishnu, the reservoir of all goodness. Similarly, you appear as Lord Shiva, master of the mode of ignorance, and thus dissolve the whole creation. You always maintain your transcendental position in spite of creating these three modes of material nature. You are never entangled in these modes of nature as the ordinary living entities are. Actually, my Lord, you are the material nature. You are the father of the universe and you are eternal time, 
which has caused the combination of the elements of nature and the manifestation of the material creation. Still, you are always transcendental to all these material activities. My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know that earth, water, fire, air, sky, the five sense objects, mind, the senses, and their deities, egotism, and the total material energy, all things animate and inanimate in this phenomenal world rests upon you. Since everything is produced of you, nothing can be separate from you. Yet, since you are transcendentally situated, nothing material can be identified with your personality. Everything is therefore simultaneously one with you and different from you. And the philosophers who try to separate everything from you are certainly mistaken in their viewpoint. My dear Lord, may I inform you that this boy, whose name is Bhagadatta, is the son of my son, Bhaumasura. He has been very much affected by the ghastly situation created by the death of his father and has become very much confused and afraid. I have therefore brought him to surrender unto your lotus feet. I request your lordship to give shelter to this boy and bless him with your lotus feet. I bring him to you so that he may be relieved of the reactions of all the sinful activities of his father." Unquote. After Lord Krishna had heard the prayers of Mother Earth, he immediately assured her of immunity from all fearful situations. He said to Bhagadatta, don't be afraid. Then he entered the palace of Bhaumasura, which was equipped with all kinds of opulences. In the palace of Bhaumasura, Lord Krishna saw 16,100 young princesses who had been kidnapped and held captive there. When the princesses saw the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, enter the palace, they immediately became captivated by the beauty of the Lord and prayed for His causeless mercy. Within their minds, they decided to accept Lord Krishna as their husband without hesitation. Each one of them prayed to providence that Krishna might become her husband. Sincerely and seriously, they offered their hearts to the lotus feet of Krishna with an unalloyed devotional attitude. As the super soul in everyone's heart, Krishna could understand their uncontaminated desire and he agreed to accept them as his wives. Thus, he arranged for suitable garments and ornaments for them, and each of them, seated on a palanquin, was dispatched to Dwarka city. Krishna also collected unlimited wealth from the palace, a treasure of chariots, horses, jewels, and so on. He took from the palace 50 white elephants, each with four tusks, and all of them were dispatched to Dwarka. After this incident, Lord Krishna and Satyabhama entered Amaravati, the capital city of the heavenly planets, and they immediately entered the palace of King Indra and his wife 
Sati Devi, who welcomed them. Krishna then presented Indra with the earrings of Aditi. When Krishna and Satyabhama were returning from the capital city of Indra, Satyabhama remembered Krishna's promise to give her a Parijata tree. Taking the opportunity of having come to the heavenly kingdom, she uprooted a Parijata tree and placed it on the back of Garuda. Once Narada had taken a Parijata flower and presented it to Krishna's senior wife, Sri Rukmini Devi. On account of this, Satyabhama had developed an inferiority complex. She also wanted such a flower from Krishna. Krishna could understand the competitive womanly nature of his co-wives and he had smiled. He had immediately asked Satyabhama, why are you asking for only one flower? I would like to give you a whole tree of Parijata flowers. Actually, Krishna had purposefully, had purposely taken his wife Satyabhama with him so that she could collect the Parijata with her own hand. But the denizens of the heavenly planets, including Indra, were very irritated. Without their permission, Satyabhama had uprooted a Parijata tree, which is not to be found on the earth planet. Indra, along with other demigods, offered opposition to Krishna and Satyabhama for taking away the tree. But in order to please his favorite wife, Satyabhama, Krishna became determined and adamant. So there was a fight between the demigods and Krishna. As usual, Krishna came out victorious and he triumphantly brought the Parijata tree chosen by his wife to this earth planet, to Dwarka. After this, the tree was installed in the palace garden of Satyabhama. On account of this extraordinary tree, the garden house of Satyabhama became extraordinarily beautiful. As the Parijata tree came down to the earthly planet, the fragrance of its flowers also came down and the celestial drones migrated to this earth in search of their fragrance and honey. King Indra's behavior towards Krishna was not very much appreciated by great sages like Shukadev Goswami. Out of his causeless mercy, Krishna had gone to the heavenly kingdom, Amaravati, to present King Indra with his mother's earrings, which had been lost to Bhaumasura, and Indra had been very glad to receive them. But when a Parijata tree from the heavenly kingdom was taken by Krishna, Indra had fought with him. This was self-interest on the part of Indra. He had offered his prayer, tipping down his head to the lotus feet of Krishna. But as soon as his purpose had been served, he became a different creature. That is the way of the dealings of materialistic men. Materialistic men are always interested in their own profit. For this purpose, they can offer any kind of respect to anyone. But when their personal interest is over, they are no longer friends. This selfish nature is found not only among the richer class of men on this planet, but even in personalities like Indra and other demigods. Too much wealth makes a man selfish. 
A selfish man is not prepared to take to Krishna consciousness and is condemned by great devotees like Shukadev Goswami. In other words, possession of too many worldly riches is a disqualification for advancement in Krishna consciousness. After defeating Indra, Krishna arranged to marry the 16,100 girls brought from the custody of Bhaumasura. By expanding himself into 16,100 forms, he simultaneously married them all in different palaces at the same auspicious moment. He thus established the truth that Krishna and no one else is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There is nothing impossible for Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is all-powerful, omnipresent, omnipresent and imperishable, and so there is nothing wonderful in this pastime. All the palaces of the more than 16,000 queens of Krishna were filled with suitable gardens, furniture, and other paraphernalia, to which there is no parallel in this world. There is no exaggeration in this story from Srimad Bhagavatam. The queens of Krishna were all expansions, expansions of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmiji. Krishna lived with them in different palaces and he treated them exactly the same way an ordinary man treats his wife. We should always remember that the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna was playing exactly like a human being. Although he showed his extraordinary opulences by simultaneously marrying more than 16,000 wives in more than 16,000 palaces, he behaved with them just like an ordinary man. Okay. And his strictly and he strictly followed the relationship between husband and wife required in ordinary homes. Thing. <clears throat> Therefore, it is very difficult to understand the characteristics of the Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead. Even demigods like Brahma are unable to probe into the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. The wives of Krishna were so fortunate that they got the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their husband Although their husband's personality was unknown even to Brahma and the other demigods. In their dealings as husband and wife, Krishna and his queens would smile, talk, joke, embrace and so on. And their conjugal relationship ever increasingly developed. In this way, Krishna and the queens enjoyed transcendental happiness in their household life. Although each and every queen had thousands of maidservants engaged for her service, the queens were all personally attentive to serving Krishna. Each one of them used to receive Krishna personally when he entered the palace. They engaged in seating him on a nice couch worshipping him with all kinds of paraphernalia, washing his lotus feet with Ganges water, offering him betel nuts and massaging his legs. In this way, they gave him relief from the fatigue he felt after being away from home. They fanned him nicely, offered him fragrant essential floral oil, decorated him with flower garlands, dressed his hair, asked him to lie down to take rest, bathed him personally, and fed him palatable dishes. 
Each queen did all these things herself and did not wait for the maidservants. In other words, Krishna and his different queens displayed on this earth an ideal household life. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the 59th chapter of Krishna, the deliverance of the demon Bhaumasura. Thank you very much. Om Ajnana Tamilandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurin Miditam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupakada Maihyam Tathati Shapadantika Pande Hang Shri Guru Shri Jatapadakamalan Shri Gurun Vaishnavanscha Shri Rupam Shagrasatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitamstam Sativam Sadvaitam Savatutam Pradijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lolita Shri Vishakan Vitamstra He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hori Priye Vansha Kolpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindho Pyevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Nama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Dhamma Hare Dhamma 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 Hare Hare Krishna Krishna. So this Bomasura had kidnapped sixteen thousand princesses. He'd taken the umbrella of Varuna by force. He'd stolen the mm, earrings of Aditi. He'd occupied the mm, money parvat. And uh, Indra therefore came to complain to Krishna, to ask for help. And Krishna set out for uh, Pragjotishpur, Bhamasura's capital, along with Satyabhama. This Pragyotishpur, Pragya, if I remember, is Gohati. Yes? Okay. Gohati in, in Assam, in northeastern, far northeastern India. So the Lord set out there, and he found the city surrounded by these various fortifications, fabricated by the demon Mura. So Krishna smashed all the fortifications and killed the five-headed demon and then killed his sons and annihilated, of course, the opposing army. The Then the Lord came before Bhomasura himself, and there was a fight, and as usual, Krishna emerged victorious. This Bhomasura was the son of the earth personified. He was also sometimes called Narakasura, 
And it's said in some of the Puranas, I believe, that he was the son of the earth by the Lord himself. So the Lord defeated Bomasura, killed him, smashed his army, defeated the elephants, and so on. So in this way, the Lord earned victory. The earth personified appeared before the Lord, offered him a vigilant garland, returned to Diti's dazzling earrings and Varuna's umbrella and presented Krishna also a valuable jewel. Then she offered prayers to the Lord in great ecstasy. The, she identified him as the bearer of the four symbols, uh, Shankar Chakra Gada Padma, Kanch, Disc, Lotus, and Club. She said that Krishna was the super soul and that he satisfies the aspirations of all devotees. He descends his incarnations just suitable to satisfy the devotees' desires. The various uh, the Lord, a lotus flower grows from his navel. He's garlanded by lotus flowers. His eyes are like lotuses and therefore pleasing to the eyes of others. He has lotus feet that pacify the lotus hearts of the devotees. He has all six opulences. He's the reservoir of knowledge. He's unborn, but still he's the father of the whole cosmos, the reservoir of all energies. The whole world is caused by the Lord, who's both the cause and effect of the cosmic manifestation. The three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, are not independent of the Lord. The Lord creates, maintains, and destroys through these Three, but the Lord is never entangled in the modes of nature like ordinary living entities. Then the earth said that you are the material nature and you are the father of the universe, your time, which causes the combinations of the elements of nature and causes the manifestation of the material creation, but you're always transcendental. Everything in the phenomenal world rests upon the Lord, so everything is produced of him, nothing is separate from him, and yet the Lord is transcendentally situated and nothing material can be identified with him. So everything simultaneously one with him and different from him. So in this way, the earth personified offered prayers, and she presented her grandson, Bhagdatta. She said he's been very much affected by this ghastly death of his father, so he's confused, he's afraid. Please uh, offer him shelter and bless him. I brought him to surrender to you. Um, and uh, Krishna, after hearing the prayers, assured her of freedom from all fear, told Bhagdatta, don't be afraid. And then he entered uh, Bomasura's palace. Would you like a chair? No. no? Okay. There were 16,100 princesses, and they all became captivated by the Lord's beauty and decided within their minds they, that they wanted Krishna 
as their husband. They all prayed to Providence uh, for this and offered their hearts at Krishna's lotus feet. The Srila Prabhupada has commented elsewhere that the girls were in a difficult situation because they'd been kidnapped and kept at Bomasura's palace. According to Vedic culture, a girl who's been out of home even for a night is now a girl whose character can be, uh, is, whose character is in question. She stayed in some other man's house. So what can we say about her purity? So, um, so then no one will marry such a girl. There was an incident in Srila Prabhupada's career, there were two um, Indian girls who joined the temple in Nairobi, I believe. And uh, they were unmarried girls, and, and they joined. And the parents pleaded that, uh, no, please let our daughter stay at home. And Srila Prabhupada, understanding the situation, agreed that, yes, they can stay at home. So the Prabhupada, in telling the story of these princesses, said that uh, Krishna freed them from Bhomasra, so now you're, you're free. But they were all hesitating. Uh, that, well, now what? Who will accept us as our as, uh, wives? Uh, so Krishna said, all right, then what do you want? We want you as your husband, as our husband. And Krishna said, all right, come on. <laughs> so Krishna arranged for suitable garments and ornaments for all of these princesses and dispatched them on palanquins to Dwarka. He collected unlimited wealth and sent that uh, from uh, Pragjotishpur. Prag then they went, Krishna and Satyabhama, riding on Garuda, went to Amaravati and Indra and Shachidevi welcomed them very nicely, and Krishna returned the earrings. But Satyabhama reminded Krishna that you promised me a parijata tree, so she just uprooted one and put it on Garuda's back. And now the Indra was outraged. This is a a holy tree, it's meant for the heavenly planets, it can't be, it's an insult to the parijata for it to come to earth. And you, you didn't ask, there was no permission. So he uh, offered Krishna a fight, he fought against Krishna, and various demigods joined along with Indra. But Krishna uh, emerged victorious, Prabhupada said, as usual and brought the tree back to Satyabhama's palace. This behavior by Indra wasn't very much appreciated, and I think we mentioned earlier that when Indra was offering prayers after the end of the Govardhan Leela, he was... Uh, Jiva Goswami and I think Krishna comments that Krishna, that his prayers were not quite heartfelt, not quite 100%. They were a bit calculated. Uh, my dear Lord, please don't do more to me. <laughs> You've already humiliated. It's enough. Please don't do more. So I surrender to you. Please don't hurt me. It was something calculated not 100% surrender. And we see that because now when Indra's self-interest is impinged upon, he again opposes Krishna. 
So uh, as Prabhupada said, he uh, offered his prayers, but now as soon as his purpose had been served, he became a different creature. And this is how materialistic people deal. They'll offer respects to anyone to get what they want, but then uh, when their personal interests are served, all the respect and friendship is over. So this is found not only in human society, but even by among the demigods. So Prabhupada comments, the possession of too many worldly riches is a disqualification for advancement in Krishna consciousness. So then Krishna came back to Dwarka, married the 16,108 princesses simultaneously at the same auspicious moment in each of the different palaces by expanding himself into 16,100 forms. The palaces were all opulent with gardens and furniture and everything else you could ask for. And the queens, who were all expansions of Lakshmi, lived with the Lord in these palaces. And Krishna dealt with them. Their dealings were like those of ordinary human beings, but they were all transcendental. The queens all served Krishna personally, even though they had so many maidservants, their pleasure was to personally serve the Lord in all respects. Prabhupada said, in other words, Krishna and his different queens displayed on earth an ideal household life. And I wonder if we have some comments or questions. Yes. Um, microphone, yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, Marge, if a in Vedic culture, if a woman is outside the house for mm. one night, then her chastity is questioned. A, a Kshatriya princess. Mm. But then we hear all these Kshatriya kings like kidnapping one wife here, one there, the other. Mm. It feels quite sexist. But they wouldn't kidnap married girls. In fact, that comes in the pastime of Bhishma Dev with those uh, Amba, um, uh, Amba, uh, Ambika and Ambalika, one of them had already chosen that Shalva should be my husband, and you've ruined everything by kidnapping me. And so in that way, it was um, problematic. And all right, he didn't become my husband, so then she... Well, went to Bhishma, now you have to become my husband. You kidnapped me. Uh, but uh, he refused. Uh, he had his own vow and sent her back. Shalva will certainly receive you. But Shalva refused. That now you've, you're, you know, what would, should we say? Uh, like damaged goods or rejected, you're rejected. So then, again, he came back to the court, but then there was no uh, relief from her. Shalva wouldn't take her. Bhishma couldn't marry her. So then uh, we know the history that she cursed. Uh, she became the multiple lifetime enemy of Bhishma Dev. And, uh, yeah. Is that all right? No? Go on. It, it, in that ex example, you know, there doesn't seem to be any justice. The, no, it's, it's not answered. <laughs> it, it, so it doesn't really speak to it not being sexist. But it's, sorry? It doesn't really speak to the principle of as it not being sexist. Well, the basic principle is that we don't take used wives 
as it were, and we don't kidnap other people's wives. You don't, we don't find any history in, in Bhagavatam. Uh, well, yeah, we do. That's, uh, who was it? Soma, I think, kidnapped the wife of Brihaspati. Uh, that was very much condemned. That was not acceptable. But the unmarried girls, this was good. If you uh, picked up an unmarried girl, that was all right. And you proved your chivalry by uh, kidnapping her from the assembly of powerful opponents. Now that was accepted. But not just uh, the Bomasaurus, of course. <clears throat> it wasn't very much appreciated. Marsh, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that there is a different level of chastity expected from women, from women as there is from men, and that feels uh, I see, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, the... It, it seems that chastity is the ornament of the woman and valor and so on is what's looked for in the man. Chastity is not so much the, the criterion for the man, but, but valor and heroism and so on. Um, the, the woman isn't supposed to be a great fighter a valorous, uh, um, quasi man, but she, her, she's what's the word? Honored for her chastity. You know, different. Uh, what should we say? Bulls in bulls and cows. You don't look for the same thing. You look for a bull to be powerful worker, to be strong, to be. Uh, yeah, strong, and you look for the cow to be uh, plentiful with milk and so on. So you don't expect the same. It's not that, we're, well, we have to be equal and expect hard work from the cows and milk from the bulls. <laughs> there are different qualifications. Yes. I was thinking in connection to the question and this story, how this story could be uh, told in favor of, yeah, the point that Krishna will, does accept the uh, possibly stained character. Yeah, that Krishna didn't care. He, Krishna is transcendental to all such customs and rules. The girls sincerely wanted to Krishna to accept them, and Krishna reciprocated. Yes, come on. And to add to that, to further that point, like us as maybe uh, the devotee men can think of this point about, you know, uh, to not find ourselves like in a superior position to Krishna. Krishna accepts this lady, or this guru accepts this lady, but then for us to be like, no, I'm not going to accept them, but I don't know, this is a thought that comes up. Um, Krishna accepts this person, you know, or, uh, or their guru accepts them, whether their past has been this or that. I'm, I'm sorry, everything's getting lost here amidst the sounds. And maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't ask the question, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's a sign. <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's just going this way and that way, I, I, I'm having a hard yeah. time getting the question. Well, my question is, um, do uh, devotee men, uh, should they consider this point a little bit, that Krishna accepts uh, this or this lady? Huh? Just, um, well, yeah, should, so should the men do what? I, I don't understand. You're going to tell me the whole story again. Should they, yes. what, should the, what is it that the men should or shouldn't do? Should they consider uh, the fact that Krishna... 
Uh, they, they should consider what Krishna did, but how does that apply to them? Is that, is that you're coming to some point of their own behavior, right? Should they, should they be stringent according to Vedic culture and their criteria for accepting wives? Is that the question? Thank you. <laughs> That's up to them. I, we can't uh, pass, a, at least I can't pass a GBC resolution. <laughs> or really it's up to them to decide what their, their criteria are. You know, should they accept a wife who can't cook? Should they accept a wife who's not uh, gorgeous? Should they accept a wife who's... Um, a little proud, should they accept it? They have to decide what matters to them, what standards they expect from their wife. They might also, if they're a little introspective, consider you know, their own value and their own uh, shortcomings. Um, so I, I'm not going to we know what the Vedic standard is, what the, the Vedic social standard is, but there's no central authority that's going to enforce or waive those requirements for ISKCON. Uh, there's a spot for you right up here, Prabhuji, on this mat. And there's a spot for you, Manaji, over here, if you'd like. There's a spot right here. It's now being occupied by a notebook, but I'm sure the notebook would make space for you. Or there's a chair at vacant there, too, so take your pick. Okay, good. And of course, the easy way around all of these difficult decisions is just to stay brahmachari. <laughs> yes. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. So, all the stories in Krishna book, all the demons are teaching about different. Um, aspects of ourselves which we, sh we should which we should work with like pride and these lesser good qualities so the, in this story what are the qualities by reading this that we will work on i don't have a an extracted uh, moral to the, so the moral to the story is there's there's nothing indicated like that just that we should hear and there are various lessons along the way. One, uh, how the Bomasura was too puffed up because of materialistic opulence, and therefore that can be an impediment for devotees. But there's no statement, okay, Bomasura represents this, and so you should try to do something about that. Um, I don't have any such conclusive lesson from the chapter, sort of. Uh, wrap up for you. Yes. My question is a little related to Rukmini's. Um, we see that when Krishna accepted all the wives uh, after they had been kidnapped, the society didn't really have a problem with mm -hmm. that. The society in Dwarka, they didn't have a problem with that. But when Lord Ramachandra accepted but Sita, when? Lord Ramachandra, mm -hmm. when he accepted Sita back after she had been kidnapped, there was there was a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Seems there were double standards even in those days. Yeah, that's one thing. It was just one Dobi who was complaining about Sita Devi. The general people were not, were satisfied. 
But Lord Ramchandra's standard was so strict that, as Prabhupada said, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. So he um, renounced even Sita Devi. But there wasn't a general public um, murmur even. Also, Lord Ramchandra was playing the role of an ideal king. Krishna was playing the role of a king too, but uh, not quite. <laughs> you know, he, Krishna goes a little this way, that way. Anything else? Something to add, Jivananda? Um, all right. The I think we can have kirtan then, if there are no other questions. Yes. Add on to my question: If Lord Ramachandra was supposed to be an ideal king, one of the qualities of a king is to be a protector. So yes. I still don't really understand how he couldn't like protect his wife. She was protected. She was under the care of, who was that, Muni? Valmiki Muni. So she wasn't left, you know, thrown out into the, the street. She was protected. But Lord Ramjandra said, no, no, I can no longer accept you. Okay. So we can end with Kirtan. We're a little ahead of schedule, but I have a, a meeting after the class in any case. And um, okay, so who would like to lead Kirtan? Who would like to lead Kirtan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे
Vishnuvishaya Om Vishnuvad Panamun Sopadi Prad Vicharja Ashto Tarasatishvi Shimad A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Shami Mraj Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda Ki Jai Nama Charja Srila Hridas Thakur Ki Jai Prem Sakaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopinath Sham Kun Radha Kun Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Vrindavan Tham Ki Jai Navadip Tham Ki Jai Jagannath Puri Ki Jai Ganga Mai Ki Jai Jamana Mai Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees all glories to the assembled devotees. Go Prem Ananda. Yes, we have books available. Anyone who would like a book, they're uh, 1595 if you're an American, and if you're here in India, whatever you want. And uh, yes, Hare Krishna.